Good morning and God bless you. Thank you for joining us again. We're at the uh, second session of our position, our perspective, and our purpose. And if you missed last week's class, you can join us on the YouTube channel that's archived for Identity Church. So we have, we are now live on Facebook. So um, I'm just going to do a quick recap of our position. Um, we talked about how our convictions are formed by our beliefs, which are born out of our desire to know, but also from our culture, out of our culture, like Pastor Charlie said in his message last Sunday. So this revelation of belonging or believing in Christ as our Savior is a heavenly revelation unveiled by the Holy Spirit of God only. This is not attained by worldly knowledge, but only by a spiritual connection with our Maker. So there's a lot of Christians, like I said last week, there's a lot of Christians that have a hard time relating to Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. And so last week we went through some historical documentation of his character and his uh, life on this earth, what happened to him in reality. And um, as well, we're going to talk about this a little later, but um, there are many books that are available, historical documents that we can um, look at and study that will help us understand his personality. Um, we can also see that a lot of the books that were written, a lot of the historical writings were left out of the Bible because of the political climate at the time that they were written, many of the different Bibles, but especially the King James Bible. So that's why I really encourage people to, um, to study on their own. Uh, there was one scripture that I wanted to bring up. There was one scripture that I had written down yesterday, but I, uh, last Sunday, but I didn't share. And it was the scripture that, uh, from John 8, 14, that the Lord talked about, and he spoke to the Pharisees. He says, I know where I came from and where I am going. And they were arguing about his witness, um, bearing witness of himself. But when we bear witness of Christ working in our lives or that we belong to Christ, then we can say, as Jesus said, I know where I come from and where I am going. And uh, that's my phone. <laughs> oh. So <laughs> this brings us into the place of sonship, and that's what this the purpose of these three classes are all about, is understanding who we are in Christ, and we understand that to a greater degree when we know our Father. And um, I wanted to speak a quote from a man named Brennan Manning, he says, our pers as our perspective of Abba is healed, we are healed, and we can walk as true sons of God. That was the Father's original intention, and it has been so misconstrued because of our different cultures and because of our inability to want, you know, we, we need to trust the Lord, but that means letting go of things that we know and our preconceived notions of things. So, so as our perspective of our Father is healed, we are healed. So I really admonish you to uh, read some of his works. I actually have a resource page today for some of his books, as I told Pastor Charlie the other night. I'm on my 11th reading of The Furious Longing of God by Brennan Manning, <laughs> which it's just like water, water to your, to your bones. So let's look at our notes uh, that you have. What is perspective? So if I were to go to the dictionary and look at what is perspective, it's a way of regarding situations, facts, and judging their relative importance. So this goes back to what we said last week about honoring the Christ and the opportunities that are in each and every person. So when we see and we look at people, we have to have the eyes of Christ, and that's something that we're going to talk about today. 
So it says a way of re, uh, the proper or accurate point of view. So who determines that it's the proper or accurate point of view? You have so many different religions, denominations out there. But the bottom line is one of the other quotes of this span is, uh, has to do with it is our personal relationship with our Father that comes at a place of intimacy where he is revealed to us. So he is not going to reveal himself the same way to me as to Pastor Charlie or Brad or Karen. Everybody gets a different perspective. Everyone has a different perspective. I mean, when I think about the way I grew up, a lot of people have a very distorted perspective of Abba. I mean, my father was abusive verbally, physically, mentally, sexually. And when I came to the Lord, I need, I wanted to know my daddy so bad. I mean, that was my heart's cry, was to know who is this Heavenly Father that created me because the one that took care of me down here was pretty bad. And, but I, and I didn't want to base, I, I had been raised Catholic, so I didn't want to base my perception of my Heavenly Father like my, my earthly father or the one they taught me in the Catholic Church that sat up there with a big stick. And um, so it's so, so very important to just press into and have intimate time with the Lord. So in the fourth point says, a, a subjective evaluation of relative significance, a point of view. So when we take in what the Father reveals to us and we are empowered and enlightened, you know, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, then we can evaluate how things are in our lives and, de and make that decision. Is this of the Lord or isn't it? And am I going to press into this or am I not? So Jesus put it, in this way, in many ways, he spoke concerning to see or seeing, all stem from a Hebrew word, to see. It is in the Bible over 3,000 times. Wow. That one word and the concept of figuratively seeing, literally seeing, advising, approving, considering, discerning, gazing, even visions. And so if it's in there over 3,000 times, that's telling me that it is extremely important the way we perceive ourselves, our Heavenly Father, each other, and circumstances that we're in. So I, I um, let me see, I didn't ask for any. I'll read this first one, but I would like, uh, I have Karen reading point number one on the second page, and then if... Someone else can do point number two. You don't. You, will you do it, Miriam? Okay, point number two and number three. I need a reader for number three. So anyway, I'm going to read the first one. This is um, one of my most favorite portions of Scripture. It's Isaiah 11, verses 2 through 5. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And that's us. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. And that is exactly where we are to be as a son of God. That, that means that we can go into a strip joint, we can go into a dump in Peru, we so, can go... Some of us cannot go into a strip. Correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. Some of you may go into a strip. Some of <laughs> us will not. <laughs> right. not I, I get... What the, okay. I, yeah, okay. I believe what the Lord is saying is Probably that... Yeah. When, yeah, my wife's going, I am not that right. <laughs> but the thing is, is that when we have eyes like the Son of God, as sons of God, then we should be able to look and be present in love in any situation. That's what he's saying. He says that um, his righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins in verse 5, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And those are the things I want to, I want to look at. 
So the girdle of his loins, it's interesting. Um, I did, you know me, I do a little research. What does that really mean? The girdle of his loins. Does anybody have any ideas or impressions of what it might mean? To, to shore up the foundation, the core. To shore, shore up your core. Yes, the Lord's submission to Did righteousness. Say what? <laughs> he probably did. Uh, is that what you said? No. Yes. Oh. Kind of, sort of. All right. It's all right. <laughs> I wasn't cheating, but I will. Really cheat. <laughs> but in, uh, in Genesis 24, 9, we see it's an act of submission where they would put their hand up underneath the loins of the person they were making the covenant with. It means that, you know, I am coveting with you in the most intimate way, down to the nitty-gritty. So it means the Lord's submission to righteousness. The girdle of his reins bringing direction during decision making. So if we're operating as a son in Isaiah 11, as he did, then we're going to have great discernment. We're going to have great dis compassion. We're going to have mm -hmm. love in our circumstances. So our purpose, our perspective, excuse me, should be righteous in origin, productive in measure, with a heart to guide and exhort, as Ephesians chapter 4 teaches us. Mm -hmm. So I want to um, go back to one thing that I um, <coughs> didn't on the other page. We were talking about perspective before. I just found it really interesting. I said to you about how there was over 120 books left out of the Bible because of the um, directives of King James when the King James Bible was written. And I just want to give you a little back history on what was happening at the time that um, Pope uh, Paul V was in office when King James was king and he backed he persecuted he persecuted Galileo <laughs> Galileo was trying to tell people that the sun revolved around the earth but the church believed the earth revolved around no, no, excuse me, it's the opposite. I'm sorry. I didn't have my coffee. Um, Galileo believed that the earth revolved around the sun, but the church taught that the sun revolved around the earth. And that was, he was considered a heretic at the time. And they took scripture that said from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, and they used that, the church used that to... Uh, back there, belief. So there was a lot going on at the time, and I did a uh, thing last week. There's lots of books, the lost books of the Bible, and different things like that that you can go through. Uh, thelostbooks.com. There's lots of things, but I have a resource page over here. So just remember that culture really affects the way people see and hear the Bible. And um, I know that Pastor Charlie was talking about, you know, you have to be very aware of, you know, you're in a Methodist church, an Episcopal church, a Lutheran church, and also other cultures, you know, going out on the missions field, you know, to be in the Philippines is different than being in South America, or being in South America is different than being in Africa, or even in Central Europe, the different places that I've been. So you have to watch. Protocol. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Protocol and culture has to come yes. into account. But you can be a son of God wherever you are. Yeah, That's the point. The point of Isaiah 11 is you can be a son of God no matter where you are. You want to say something? No. Okay. So here, here's four points to show us our perspective must contain compassion. That's one thing that I... And, I, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell on myself after we talk about this. So, Karen, would you read the very first one? It has to do with Lazarus. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' ex example, we see him moved with compassion concerning Lazarus. In John 11, 33 through 35, it reads, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, 
He groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So I picked this scripture because he groaned. And that is a very deep emotion. In, uh, in the Greek it says to have indignation on, to blame, to sigh, to sternly enjoin, straightly charge, groan, or even murmur against. And then he was troubled from the Greek to stir or agitate, to boil like water. So when I read that and I take into context the whole story about Lazarus, it seems kind of strange to me, those two feelings. But he was really angry at the people that didn't believe him, all the religious that were standing around waiting for him to fail, waiting for him to prove himself. Can you really do this? What are you, what are you going to do? So the righteous indignation was against the evil unbelief, but it produced compassion and not judgment in the Lord. I mean, he went forward, he went forward in what he came there to do and to give glory to his Father. So when, you know, when you see, I mean, do you, I mean, is this the, am I the only person that feels no, this absolutely. way? absolutely. I mean, I mean, you know, I think you got to understand, people were astonished that they saw Jesus do all these great things, but they also correlated his friendship with Lazarus. Yeah. And so how could a friend allow a friend to die? Right. That's right. But he had he had a back motive of why he waited. Yeah. I mean, what he was, you know, what the Lord was doing was saying, listen, I'm going to tell you that my, my deity is greater than my friendship, mm -hmm. and I'm going to demonstrate that. And, and mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get confused on what, what God will delay on. Correct. I believe that I too. think sometimes his delay is to get us to step up and stand up and Amen. be like him. That, exactly. You know, <clears throat> right. I'm that. waiting on God. No, maybe we're waiting on you. That, yeah, <laughs> true. That's right. You know, do you have enough compassion to groan and to weep and to, right. to, to get passionate about something? Yeah. Get ticked off enough to make something happen. Right. And, the, and uh, oh, <clears throat> I just had this thought in my head and it went away. But it was. Bird flew off the limb. <laughs> it must be that coffee. I didn't have my coffee. But um, yeah, I was thinking about that in the waiting. He did it on purpose. He did it on purpose because he. It, even Jesus said, you know, that offenses must come. And sometimes when we wait, he offended a lot of people. But it shows the condition of the heart. So that's what he was really, he was unveiling their hearts as he brought glory to his Father. So, give them a... Okay, who's going to be my reader for the second one? Mary Ann. Uh, another example of Christ's compassion, Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. That's right. So it means to wail loudly but also to weep silently. So how do you wail loudly and weep silently? It's a, it's a kind of it's a contradiction almost. Well, you're dealing with it in both realms. Yeah. Your inner man and That's your outer man. Exactly. That's right. That's good. Yeah. Yes. In your spirit and in your soul. So righteous concern and righteous judgment of circumstances will cause righteousness to rise up within us and we choose how we respond. So you will face that in many situations that you see. Number three, Jesus in his compassion is touched by our infirmities. He was touched by our infirmities. Yes, I didn't write out the whole scripture. Yeah. Oh, okay. Four. <laughs> I got it. Four. Hebrews four fifteen. Four fifteen. I know you were looking at it. Yeah, I have it somewhere. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, mm -hmm. but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Yes, it is. So completely relates to us. He was touched completely. And touched to feel sympathy with, 
to commiserate. Um, remember last week we talked about what it meant to be in Christ and how it denoted union? Mm -hmm. Well, this touching also comes from the same Greek word. It means union. So he, the, one of the devil's greatest strategies that we fall prey to is to think that we're going through something alone. Mm -hmm. And he isolates us. But if we can just get a handle on those two scriptures, the one that we were crucified with Christ, which meant complete union, we were impaled on the cross with him, and if we can get a hold of this scripture in Hebrews, that he sympathizes with us, empathizes with us, we should come to the realization in our minds and in our spirits that we are never alone. We are never alone. Amen. It doesn't matter where we are. When we're in joy, when we're in sadness, when we're in sin, we are never alone. He's always there. And it means same as to be impaled on the cross. So that we are, we are in Christ like fruit and jello, like I was explaining, gave that example. <laughs> <laughs> So we are to bear up the weak. That's another way of releasing compassion. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So I read it myself. So I'm sorry, that's my phone. To bear, to literally or figuratively. So we can do it in the natural and we can do it in the spirit. So... In the spirit, of course, we do it through prayer and intercession and travailing one for another. And in the natural, well, we do it for our friends. We help out of compassion. So I just want to go over this. If we are in Christ, with Christ, and belong to Christ, then our behavior with people, regardless of who they are, regardless of the situation, should reflect <laughs> compassion. So if we choose to see people as our Father sees them, then we will always choose love and never have any fear. So we have no fear because we trust the Father. Uh, the epitome of trust was exemplified by Jesus in his choosing to die on the cross. He totally trusted his Father. So I wanted to share, I wanted to tell on myself because I know that Everybody in here can relate to this. And it, it's about my perspective, our perspective. And here I am, I just taught last week about how even the Pharisees have the opportunity, the kingdom is in within every single person on the face of the earth. And I was in Office Depot, and I'm sitting there getting some paper, some stuff done uh, with my computer, and a lady walks up. She had to have been uh, in her late 70s. She had the biggest rhinestone glittery earrings on. Her hair was dyed in streaks of pink. She was plastered with makeup that didn't really fit her, in, from my opinion. Uh, she had clothes on that probably shouldn't have been worn by someone her age, and she was very, very overweight. And she had... Um, rings on every finger that were like one inch just full of sparkles and she walked up to the man who was helping me and she said I don't know where to go I would like to have my wedding invitations uh, printed my husband and I, we're getting married I'm getting married and inside of me, my first perception of her was, Lord, I've been waiting for a husband for 14 years. <laughs> and, and, and I could hear the Lord say, judge not lest you be judged. Yeah. And then I'm looking at this woman and my perception of her outward appearance, and he says, but Karen, you don't know her heart. And I was like, wow, slap me upside the head. <laughs> and I, my, immediately it was like, wow, I'm really sorry. Because here I am teaching about the principles of the kingdom and walking in sonship. And yet that one thing happened and the Lord got me. 
And I was, and I walked out of there and I said, Abba, I am so sorry because you love her as much as you love me. And you know that I would love to be married, but when the right one comes, when you send him, it's fine. And I have to be settled in my heart with that. And whenever you preach on something, you will be tested that week following. Oh, absolutely. That message. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, don't you know it. <laughs> yes, I do. So if you have any extra rings that have a bunch of blame on it, you'd like to borrow them. <laughs> just going to load them all up. Oh, my all gosh. All the costume jewelry you can find. Yeah, there. seriously. <laughs> so the whole message in this class is if our position determines our perspective, then our perspective determines our purpose, which then determines our behavior. So let's look at a couple of the people that the Lord ministered to. And how did it affect you? I mean, what can you get out of each situation? I'm not going to go through all of them, but... Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, sir. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Harry. I just want to freeze the coffee. You might want to hear some coffee, yeah. Harry. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's what I was going to do. Up in the last paragraph. Yeah. It says, if we choose. Mm -hmm. If to, we choose to, to yeah, see, we, yes. Where I want to be yeah. is I don't want to be put in that choice of choosing. I want to be in a position to where the love of Christ is in me, mm -hmm. that when I see somebody, mm -hmm. it's not a choice of whatever they look like. Yeah. It's automatically the agape love towards them. Absolutely. And so instead of choosing, I mean, we all want to want that way. Right. Right. I believe, I believe that. I mean, I believe that because we're on this earth, in this earthly realm, that we always, the freedom to choose is always within us. I mean, I think that, you know, it's always there. Uh, I believe Jesus had it as the Son of Man, the ability to choose. I think we have a tendency to choose what we focus on. Yeah. So I think if our eyes are full of light, we will have an easier choice of doing yes. the right choice. Mm -hmm. Right, to flow. Or if our eye is full of darkness. You always see the negative. Isn't it what we practice, though? Oh, exactly. And as well, we make those choices, and then, oh, yeah, then they get easier and easier and easier. A natural way of doing <clears throat> well, that's the same maturity. With, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's the Isaiah 11 chapter, verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord was upon me, the Spirit of wisdom, counsel, understanding. So, yeah, when you walk in that, absolutely. And then to choose not to choose evil, you know, mm -hmm. because there's those choices, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be connected to it. Yeah. yeah, so how do we respond when we, like, say... See prostitutes or lepers or tax collectors. I mean, Jesus, Jesus ministered to every facet of society, every level of society, every uh, person. You know, I think of Zacchaeus. I think of Peter come out, walk on the water. I mean, he spoke to Pontius Pilate. He spoke to the Sadducees, Pharisees. He wasn't afraid to talk to anybody. But yet we are. But yet we are. <laughs> right. And why? Because of the fear. Love, perfect love casts That's out right. all fear. It all goes back to our relationship with Father, with our Heavenly Father. And it's not about us. And it's not about us. It's about His kingdom coming, His will being done. If we were truly dead, we wouldn't have near the fears we have. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was listening to Joyce Meyer, and she was just saying, as we mature about going through trials, is that as we mature, sometimes God has us go through trials because it's for someone else. Mm -hmm. you know? Very true. Could I'm, that be because not he, for knows, us to, he knows how much we can handle, each person can handle? Would, would oh, that okay. be Absolutely. Absolutely. He says he always gives you a way to because escape, so he's always right. doing everything. He allows everything for your for your right. your blessing. Because we can be there to help somebody else go mm -hmm. through it, right. but we have to go through it with them. Yeah, it affects us. Yesterday, I, I was up in Jacksonville. You guys know Tommy Z, and mm -hmm. so he, being Tommy, he's like, "Well, you guys go to lunch and stuff." He throws a hundred dollar bill at me. I'll buy. It. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we go to a little place. We have lunch, and the bill's like thirty five dollars. I'm like. 
I love tipping good. Oh. <laughs> Damn, that's good. That's, that's good. good. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> so I said, hey, guy goes, what? I go, just tell Tommy thank you when you see him. <laughs> the guy's with it. He goes, dude, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so what is it? You're being all things to all men. You know? mm -hmm. And this guy's from, from, he's a Brit. And so if you were here last Sunday, you know I used the British culture. I said, well, yeah. let's see if this works. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. It, it does. Oh. <laughs> That's I funny. hope you explained it. I did afterwards. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But he was kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I was just thinking about when you were saying about the culture again. It's like thinking about how... Like in the Middle Eastern countries, the some of the extremist countries, how they're indoctrinated. The children, from the time they're children, they're indoctrinated on how to kill or hate. Um, you know, North Korea, how to, you know, hating democracy, cutting themselves off. Or children that are indoctrinated into sex trafficking, you know. I mean... We get indoctrinated, and it's hard to peel the layers away sometimes. That's that's and so that's true. why our perspective, you know, from where comes your help, your help comes from above. Look up, you know, it's always telling us to look up to the Lord, to look at the Lord. What does he like? And that reminds me of uh, how he looks at us. He adores us. And that was a, uh, a teaching I did on... Um, the birth of Christ and how when the wise men looked at him, how did Jesus gaze upon them? He gazed upon them with love, the eyes of love. Remember you said the Father has the hots for us because it's the Kwana love. It's the Kwana love of the Lord, the red hot fiery love of the Lord that he has for us. Amen. And so, so you weren't there? I wasn't in that conversation. Yeah. Okay. That's, she a, said wild, it that's, a, that's yeah. a wild conversation yeah. for some people. Yeah, but we, we talked about how much the Father loves us. I mean, without constraint, restraint, he doesn't see anything Amen. but him in us. That's, right. that's what he sees. That's why that scripture talks about, you know, we see in the glass dar uh, vaguely, darkly, but <clears throat> we are changed every time we make a choice to look back at him. We are changed into his image. So, yes, he, he has the quantum love for us. Red, <laughs> red hot, fiery love that burns away all the dross that we think we have in our life and uh, that's why we get stuck because we think that we have to perform or we have to um, you know be good enough or we have to do such and such and such and such to get God's approval but he says forget it I pr approve of you already so um, anyway so thank you, Jesus, because when we see our Father, then our perspective becomes clear. And we get, you know, we get 20-20 vision, and that's how we see other people. So that's what this is all about, being that son. Um, and uh, again, I use the scripture again from Luke 17, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It doesn't matter who you are. So are we ready to minister? Let's go back just a bit for a minute. Uh, to minister to the prostitute or to the lepers or the tax collectors. I mean, are we confident enough to do those kind of things? We're going to have an outreach this year in August. Hope everybody is there. And, uh, you know, so when we're there at the outreach, you can have anybody come up to you at all. And it's like Cole says, be ready in season and out of season. In it's season. crazy. I Last night we, we had a party in the neighborhood, so we were there. Last week I led Rooster to the Lord. He's telling me how much better he feels, and mm -hmm. so we're sitting there, and I, I I'm sitting on the couch, and he's talking to a, a cousin of his, and I hear them start talking about God and this that and the other. So funny, he's like, "Hey, hey, come over here, you, you need to spend some time with him, and he'll explain all this to you. Oh, that's you know? awesome. <laughs> but that's our crazy that's thing I've seen in my life. But that's your testimony. <laughs> it's crazy. You're creating a testimony in your neighborhood. And we all walk around as living epistles known and read by all men. I mean, even the Bible says we are fragrance to some. We, 
that are perishing and some that are still yet, you know, being saved. But we definitely carry something, just like Jesus carried something, just like that first description of him in the first class. I mean, he commanded attention, and he exercised his authority in a mild way, Mm -hmm. in a loving way no matter what. So I have, I just wanted this one example, and I'm watching my time, but, you know, being ready, um, I remember when I was in uh, Romania uh, years back, and we were doing a prayer, like an outdoor prayer meeting in the park in Cluj, and this little boy came up out of the sewer. Uh, He saw us using flags, and I mean, he was in the raggiest of rags I ever saw. He must have been maybe five years old, tops. And um, he came over, and I was I was flying this uh, blood flag. I love flying blood flags outside. And so the little boy came up, and he my interpreter was with me, and he asked what I was doing, and you know is in a short amount of time, I just explained we were worshiping God, we were praying to God, and he asked me, he says, well, would you pray to God for me? So the woman ended up praying with him and led him to the Lord. But that is the promise that Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So when we become mature sons of God, then we become like magnets, and we have testimonies like this man over here in his neighborhood. So that is what the Lord wants and desires out of us. So, um, and we have to remember we don't have to do everything, some plant, some water, some harvest, so we don't have to take on the whole job ourselves, just the, the job, our job description or whatever, we're ambassadors and we're sons of God, and that's how the Father desires for us to live. So um, I'm going to wrap it up. So our example will always be Jesus, from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, always be Jesus. We have the fullness of these abilities with inside of us. Some of us have it to a greater degree than others. That's why we honor each other's gifts. But we all have it. We all have this capability. And the fruit of it is... Isaiah 58, it says, And they shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. That's what we do when we exercise our uh, life as a son of God. So our example will always be Jesus. Um, So we choose to see with redemptive eyes and not with the eyes of the flesh. So the way we perceive our life and the life around us will ultimately affect our own life and the life of others. So this lesson, our position determines our perspective, our perspective determines our purpose, and our purpose determines our behavior. So that will be next week. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church.